Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Ушанка Show. Today I would like to return to the topic of the Soviet vacation. I already covered that uh, topic, that subject quite extensively in my Soviet vacation videos, which is number 95, 97, 98, 99 and 100. And especially in my video number 98, I talked in depth there about Soviet people going overseas to visit other countries. Recently, I stumbled upon some diary that lady kept while traveling on the cruise liner from Leningrad all around the Northern Europe. And because she kept the diary, we got some uh, witness account of that type of trip. So they traveled from Leningrad to Stockholm, to Oslo, Norway, to Dublin, to London, and back to Leningrad. So quite impressive trip. And today we're going to look uh, in the beginning of that diary. So that was a pretty extensive cruise. It lasted almost four weeks uh, from October 20th till November 13th of 1978. So I was seven year old, just started school. And this lady where he was married had a kid. So that's the older generation of the Soviet people. The author of this diary is Nelly Rikova, unfortunately passed away in 1989 and it says she kept the diary for her daughter that remained at home while they, she traveled, uh, her mom traveled with her dad through the Europe and the diary for 42 years was in the family archives and now her grandson got hang of it and uh, he published some of the most interesting parts of the diary and showed some photos. So that cruise allowed Soviet citizens to see Denmark, Sweden, France, Finland, Norway, Great Britain, and Ireland. Nelly and her husband Alexander used to live in Ukraine, Soviet Socialist Republic, in a city called Varashilovgrad. Now, if you uh, pull Google Maps or any modern maps, you won't find Varashilovgrad on the maps. It was renamed back to original pre-revolution named Lugansk. But for a long time it was Varashilovgrad, so the city of Comrade Varashilov. Maybe he was born there, but that was the Soviet name of that uh, city, Varashilovgrad. Now it's again Lugansk. And speaking of renaming cities and towns and villages, the Soviets were famous for changing the names and I'm talking even like a historical names of the cities. It's like they were trying to wipe out the old history. I'm shocked personally that, for example, Nizhny Novgorod, this is so Russian history related city, related name, that Nizhny Novgorod was renamed to Gorky after a famous Soviet writer. And of course, St. Petersburg had a quite a trip. It changed from St. Petersburg to Petrograd. So when the first World War War started with Germany, it wasn't cool anymore to use Burg, which is a German word. So Peterburg turned into Petrograd, the Grad of Peter. And of course, after revolution, it was renamed again into Leningrad. So we got St. Petersburg, Petrograd, then Leningrad, then back to St. Petersburg. I am not sure how many people would recognize the famous town if I call Tsaritsyn. But everyone knows Stalingrad. So Stalingrad before 1925 was Tsaritsyn which you can translate the one that belongs to the Tsarina. Then of course it was Stalingrad for a while and now it's Volgograd. And I think Stalin participated in a battle for Tsaritsyn and that's one of the reasons why uh, he later put his name on it. And then of course the another German sounding name in a German town, Kenningsburg, got renamed into Kaliningrad. 
even in the 80s, we had a short wave of renaming cities. Actually, some people got very upset, like locals, because when Brezhnev passed away, a small town got renamed Brezhnev. I think it was Nabirezhne Chilny, and then it was renamed back to Nabirezhne Chilny after a while. When Comrade Andropov passed away in 1984, the town of Rybinsk got renamed into Andropov. In 1985, when Comrade Chernenka followed Comrade Andropov, which followed Comrade Brezhnev, they renamed a town in Siberia Sharipova into Chernenka. But that name lasted only for three years. In 1988, it was once again Sharipova. So out of all Soviet leaders, only two poor fellows that didn't get some town or city named after them was Comrade Khrushchev and Comrade Gorbachev. And all the common thing about those is only two guys that didn't pass away while being a captain of the Soviet ship. I apologize for this little detour. I just thought it was kind of interesting to mention the situation with constant renaming of cities and towns back in the Soviet days. And now we return back to the Nelly's trip diary. And I think in this video today, we're just going to cover her first entry because we need to like break it down and talk about it. In this simple entry, I just found so many interesting, cute details. And I think it would be really important to like slow down and discuss in detail. So her first entry in the diary, it's actually kind of summarizes the pre-story to the actual trip and she writes husband informed that he is going to this trip and i and my daughter or our daughter in the summer can go for a week to the black sea and do something else you want so we can learn a lot just from one single line so her husband informs her that he got this putyovka remember if you watch my videos you can't just go to the a travel agency and say hey i would like to go for this trip it's actually was almost like dispersed uh, through the system so at his place of work uh, it was his opportunity to obtain this putyovka this trip cruise trip uh, east in, into the northern europe so he informed his wife that he's going by himself and as the kind of compensation he told her that hey you can take our daughter to the Black Sea for a week. Once again, the most desirable destination for Soviet people is to spend a week or two at the Black Sea and do anything else you want. So here we go, you already kind of tell uh, there is a problem in the family. Sounds to me like the husband is quite a selfish guy because he's just like, hey, I got this trip, I'm going myself and you guys can do something else. And she continues her diary. Me, of course, become very angry and started collecting money, saving and uh, cut on everything uh, expenses wise. So it sounds to me like the excuse was, hey, it's very expensive. I don't have enough money to pay for both of us to go on this cool trip. So I just gonna go myself and you guys go to Black Sea, which is way cheaper. So it sounds like wife wasn't ha having any of it. And she actually saying that she started like refusing on like even basic. So she was saving every copic and she continues. Meanwhile, so while she's saving money and, you know, saving on everything. Meanwhile, he continued visiting restaurants and whores. Well, she's using Russian word blyad. And I had to like ask my wife, you know, my American wife that uh, I couldn't. Make sure, I want to make sure I can translate correctly because Bliad can be translated as a whore or as a slut. And what I kind of learned that sluts are the ones that sleep around, they don't mind to sleep with her best friend, boyfriend. And whores usually do it for some kind of reward money and, or whatever. So basically what I learned in this little uh, English lesson that Every whore is a slut, but not every slut is a whore. Uh, but anyway, so it sounded like, like he was just continuing spending money in restaurants and on sluts. 
So here there's another part of the Soviet culture. Like quite often I had a question, people ask me like, how often do you guys go to restaurants to eat out and stuff like that? And it's a huge difference uh, between Soviet restaurant and like American restaurants. Here people go to eat, there people go to party. So food is nice, but you don't eat a lot, you mostly drink. So this is like, a, if you have a lot of money, then this is what you do go. You go to the restaurant and maybe there'll be some girls hanging out there that like to have a quality time, have some drinks and have some fun. So this is what she's upset that her husband was still blowing money on the restaurants and whores. So and restaurants were pretty expensive uh, to go to and eat there. And back to the diary. So she just uh, continues. Generally, I it's interesting another Soviet expression, krutilas. So I literally translate like you were spinning around as much as you could. So she was attempting to make any additional income any way possible. Uh, so she uh, was spinning as I could. I was very tired and I was uh, banging away pretty much like working hard and doing anything possible to earn extra money all summer. So she didn't take vacation that summer as husband suggested like, hey, I'll go uh, on a trip and you just stay here and have a good time and then she continues by the end i didn't want to go anywhere i actually didn't want to live anymore so she like really broke her you know like a straw broke camel's back so all that hard effort to gather money save money earn money uh, for this trip uh, she just was so tired but she said i had too many hopes uh, placed on this trip and there she continues as a result I paid the money on the 5th. I borrowed 600 rubles from Losha, so some friend of hers or relative, and also borrowed another 300 rubles in a different spot. I'll pay back. It's not that bad. So there's a situation. So husband definitely refused to pay anything for her trip. So he's like, okay, if you get this money, then go ahead. So. She doesn't specify how much she managed to earn, but she still had to borrow 900 rubles uh, from some other people. So we're talking, you know, 900 rubles and she maybe had five, 600 rubles. So this is a annual income for the average Soviet worker. So this trip, if you convert to the average American worker, you know, it's, we're talking maybe what you have to pay $30,000 for two week cruise in the Northern Europe. So this is, besides this, uh, so many people wanna go that it's uh, hard to get that Putyovka and the cost of Putyovka close to your annual income. But she had so many hopes for this trip. So she managed to earn some and then borrow another 900 rubles to go for this trip. So the actual trip started on October 17 when they left by train from Varshilovgrad to Moscow. So it looks like there was no direct train from Varshilovgrad, Ukraine to Leningrad. So they had to take train to Moscow first and then change the trains and go to Leningrad. So she just writes down that she collected all her belongings. Uh, she borrowed from Luba, so that's a female friend, uh, traveling case and a bag. So once again, there's a Soviet family, you know, they, she managed to scrape enough money for this trip, but then she borrows the case. So she didn't have her own traveling case, or maybe she never needed one. And um, at two o'clock at 2 p.m., all the group got together, so around 40 people. So there was a whole group was 40 people from Varshilovgrad. So I guess they had a batch of these Putyovkas for that city. And there's 40 lucky people got together and then instant comment i guess they hop on the bus because it says we uh, drove around our town so we don't miss it uh, for a little bit so we don't have dreams about it and then we arrived to the train station Vaxal. so <laughs> this is already interesting kind of interesting like okay we lived our life in this city so let's uh, take a like a drive by uh, so we don't miss it much and it doesn't come back to us in our dreams then she writes that on the train, uh, they met a quite interesting couple in their coupe. If you watch my videos about Soviet trains, about traveling by train, the cheapest way was Platzkart, which was like wide open or uh, 
coupe was the individual kind of rooms with four uh, spots so the four people in each room and they had that sliding door so coupe so they met this couple otherwise they just enjoyed the trip uh, we're watching the nature out of the window and uh, tea with sugar it was a beautiful morning so it's november already so i said everything was covered by frost and beautiful uh, scene villages churches and so on okay so i hope you like this story and uh, if you guys are interested please post in your comments i can continue and we can look more about uh, uh, this lady's impressions of the west and how the trip went i mean all they had was 63 dollars for two of them uh, to spend that's the only amount of money was allowed and of course they had a, a guide and kgb supervisor uh, so all matches like that story that i told you earlier this is the actual witness account and it just matches 100 percent all right, well, today we continue following the journey of the young Soviet couple, an angry wife Nelly and her naughty husband, who purchased Putyovka's uh, like trip to Northern uh, Europe on the cruise ship Estonia, which happened in October of 1978. A group of 40 people from Ukrainian town of Vashilovgrad traveled by train to Moscow and we'll follow this trip thanks to the diary that Nelly kept for the duration of this cruise. It's definitely a unique situation because unfortunately not many people keep diaries. Actually my diary saved my bacon when I decided to write a book about my adventures in America because I diligently kept diary all the way through 1995 and 96 and 97, 98. So she kept a diary and fortunately they didn't throw it away after she passed away so now we have this great opportunity to look back into 1978 okay so back to her diary so they were on a train from Vashilovgrad to moscow and then the next it says in moscow we took a taxi for four rubles so she is really specific about money spent to leningrad railroad station now so in moscow they have several railroad stations and they were names were based on the direction so all the trains from south from ukraine were arriving to kievsky vokzal so it's a kiev railroad station and so from the kiev railroad station they had to travel all across the moscow to leningrad railroad station which trains that go north which is extremely inconvenient they probably could use public transportation, but all the luggage they had was, I bet you, quite inconvenient. So they could save a lot of money and maybe spend 50 kopecks traveling by bus or tra uh, tramway or trolley bus. But they decided to just take a taxi and do it quick and easy. So when they arrived to the Leningradsky Vokzal, Leningrad railroad station, it says they could barely... Uh, find spot to store their luggage so they had so-called camera hranenia so remember those good old days before 9-11 you can actually uh, find lockers to store your luggage so you can uh, spend some time without carrying your bags around so that's what they went for at the train station they found camera hranenia so that was like individual lockers a pretty much big room and a mean lady you pay money uh, she puts your bags uh, or travel cases on a shelf and give you this number that where your luggage is and then you can roam the Moscow uh, if you have time. And there it goes quite interesting. So she claims that Starosta, so they have a lady who is in charge of their group. So she called like Starosta, so can't even know how to translate correctly. But so she's in charge of the group and she said that everyone should be back by 10 p.m because train leaves at 11 at 2300 but totally by accident two of the ladies from their group found out the train actually leaves at 2130 at 930 so that's really strange why she told them the wrong time but she basically told them to come back at 10 p.m while train actually was leaving at 930 so it kind of messed uh, through the range in their plans because it looks like they wanted to uh, actually explore Moscow before hopping on a train to Leningrad. So then it looks like they went uh, to explore Moscow and it says the sub Moscow subway is beautiful, very, very pretty 
station. So if you've ever been in Moscow, they really spend a lot of money making subway stations which look like palaces, which is really kind of, now looking back, I find it extremely strange. Why would you spend so much time and money and put marble and all these fancy decorations on a subway station? But of course, when I first time saw subway station in New York, I was shocked how basic and not cool it was. Next, I visited Ismailovsky Park. And she writes that she enjoyed the smell of freshness, forest, and fall. I mean, we're talking about October, right? So fallen leaves create a special smell that I enjoy too. Then Nelly writes that she wasn't able to do any shopping and then they had lunch in the restaurant Moscow. So it seems to me as there was organized, organized excursion. So from the train station, they actually took a bus and like did a group excursion all over the Moscow. After lunch, they also saw Red Square, Kremlin, Lenin's Mausoleum, the Church of Vasily Blazhenny, and she wrote that she was very impressed with the nighttime uh, lighting for the church. So, you know, at night when they turned the lights to illuminate the church, she was very impressed. And then they left for Leningrad. They arrived to Leningrad in early morning, and looks like she's complaining that till 9 a.m. they had to be just waiting at the train station. Now, if you arrive from Moscow to Leningrad. So in Moscow, you need to be at the Leningrad train station. And when you arrive to Leningrad, you arrive to Moscow train station, Moskovsky Vokzal. Finally, at nine o'clock, a bus arrived and it took them to the seaport, Moskvoy Vokzal. So like a sea station almost, you can just lay there. They had breakfast. And after breakfast, they had so-called free time. So Nelly right away went to Passage, so that's, be my guess, biggest shopping area those days in Leningrad. And she purchased herself a jacket, uh, shoes, gloves, nightgown, bra. So it seems like in, Vol in uh, Varshilovgrad, those items weren't available. So she had to wait to, in buy stuff in Leningrad, take her opportunity. So as I mentioned many times, cities like Moscow, especially Moscow, then Leningrad, they were best supplied cities in Soviet Union. So those stores were had way more better selection, way more goods than uh, stores in the small towns like Varashilovgrad. And the most interesting and curious part started after she returned back to the uh, sea port and she wrote that next was conversation or like interview with and we use the word organ it's almost you can translate like a inner gut it's another meaning of the word but organ it means that she talked to kgb so actually every person who was heading out for the trip beyond the soviet union had to have a conversation, an interview with KGB officer, ex, you know, discuss what they can do, how they uh, supposed to behave and stuff like that. So short sentence, just потом на собеседование с органами. That's a big deal. I mean, look, they could fail you right there if they get suspicious that maybe you're planning to escape and you can just lose your chance to see other countries. So she went uh, through the interview successfully. Then, of course, the Soviet Union is get even better. Then her next sentence is "nudny dasmotr," so their belongings got searched. So, like "nudny" means like there was long and boring process. So they opened their luggage and they went through all their stuff, make sure they don't smuggle anything out of country, and they probably were looking for any contraband or. Uh, currency, foreign currency, or Soviet rubles. Like you weren't supposed to take any extra money with you except was what was allowed. 
and a quick comment, quick note. Uh, there were some comments in my previous video about this trip. Um, so every Soviet tourist was allowed to purchase only a specific amount of foreign currency. So these people, they had about $32 per person. So they were allowed to convert uh, Soviet rubles into dollars and I was too lazy to do the math, but at that time, official exchange rate was 63 kopecks for one dollar. So 63 rubles could buy one hundred dollars. But of course, they don't let you buy hundred dollars. They only let you buy what looks like. So they be if they got 32, so maybe like 20 rubles, they had, they they could convert 20 rubles and 32 dollars. That's it. This is only money you're allowed to take with you on a two-week trip across the northern Europe. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? How how little amount. You could just buy some basic souvenirs, nothing else. And I'm actually planning to make a separate video on the topic about... Because this is one of the things that people who miss Soviet Union, they always mention how strong was the Soviet ruble that for you could buy $100 for only 63 rubles although in reality if you wanted to go and buy like if you don't have any trip coming up you could find people that would sell you dollars but the black market rate was three to four rubles per one dollar so official rate was 63 kopecks per dollar real market rate was three rubles rubles per one dollar so some people would buy on the black market and then they try to smuggle those dollars with them on a trip so they can buy more goods. That's the reason why every tourist was searched prior aboarding the ship or a plane. Okay, so back to the diaries. So they, after interview and the search, they finally got all their papers officially stamped and at 10 o'clock they boarded the ship, the cruise liner called Estonia. Now, I also had some questions about Estonia because they were used uh, several, quite a few years ago, a ferry called Estonia sunk with a big loss of life. I think we're talking about different ships. This was actually a cruise liner. It wasn't a ferry boat. So, but it also, also uh, had a name Estonia or she probably, right? The ship's supposed to be she, not it. So after boarding the Estonia ship, Nelly writes that she was very impressed that after dirt or mud and cold weather and rain, she was very impressed with the ship, that everywhere was the rugs and every room, Kayuta, was designed for four people, had its personal uh, shower and bathroom. It was warm and cozy there. So as you see, our heroes Heroes of our story already had quite an adventure and a cruise even didn't start yet. It just, the whole adventure was just to get from the Voroshilovgrad to Leningrad and they already experienced a lot of interesting new things. So now they're on the cruise liner Estonia ready to head out and uh, see Stockholm. And another quick side note, I actually read some of the diary, not the printed version. And she mentions that they had agreement with her husband that in order to make everything look good, they're going to go together on this trip. And after they're done with cruise, they're going to break up and divorce. So another kind of really awkward situation. We have this uh, family couple going on the cruise for the very first time in their life. It's kind of romantic, right? But they already have the arrangement that after they're done with this cruise, they're going to split up and divorce. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, part two of the Soviet cruise story. As always, i more than happy to see your comments and your likes on this video. Today we're going to continue to follow our friends, our unhappy Soviet family, Nelly and her naughty husband, who are on a cruise across the northern Europe and uh, today they are traveling to Stockholm, Sweden. 
Her next diary entry is dated to October 20th. So the ship Estonia left the port of Leningrad at midnight and all day on October 20th they were just crossing the Baltic Sea on the way to Stockholm. We were in the sea all day, got ourselves familiar with the ship, walked around on the deck and met other tourists. It was slightly choppy and the sea was just unbelievable. The color of water, color of waves, splashes, sun, birds, everything was just very impressive. Water was pure and clean like glass, but every day they dump a bunch of trash right out of ship into the water. Next entry is October 21 to October 23, Stockholm. We arrived to Stockholm in the morning. Buses arrive at 10 a.m. Our guide is the emigrant lady. She is the widow of the enemy of the people. I wish uh, Nelly would specify more, but so they got a guy who could speak Russian, and she was a widow of the enemy of the people. So I, it will be interesting to find out more, of course. It's kind of interesting that Nelly actually wrote down what the lady was wearing, that she had a nice uh, fur coat and a yellow hat and a yellow matching high heel shoes. She was about 60 and looked very good, spoke fluent Russian. Then they went on the excursion on the bus, and it's curious that she uh, comments how neat everything, the grass is mowed, the bushes trimmed, the two, three-story homes are neat and look really good, trees everywhere, and it kind of brings my memories when I came to America. For some reason, like when I was, even in Michigan, I mean, we're talking like middle of nowhere, Michigan, I had this weird kind of feeling that like the stuff around here looks almost like not real and I couldn't understand why. And that's because everything is so neat, like grass mowed, you know, people keep it all neat and they trim their bushes. So after seeing shaggy grass and uh, stuff like that, unkept bushes back home, it was just bizarre to see everything so neat. So I kind of, I, I see what she's seeing. Then Nelly continues, uh, I have a couple of words about Swedes. They work six hours a day. Everything is very expensive here, but they have large salaries. Store displays are amazing with the selection of goods they have. Town is neat and clean. Then she describes the skating ring next to the church and the municipal building. And she noticed there's a lot of kids that dressed very bright and have a lot of, she said, nigritiat, so small uh, black children, uh, all without any hats, but wearing gloves, and little kids are wearing helmets. And then she continues that uh, Swedes have very high... Uh, like level of life, lower birth rates, and the highest uh, life expectancy is 72 years for men and 76 and a half for women. So I guess this guide was, a lady was providing that information. Uh, she said they're kind of, Swedes are very, like don't have a lot of emotions and very organized. A youth live separately from parents. They have uh, lessons of sex. And cosmetology and housekeeping at schools. Sports are so popular that if uh, uh, some Swedish drowns, it considers as the only way he can drown is to commit suicide. <laughs> it's just funny. I just honestly, I find it bizarre reading her diary because she wrote personal diary, but it's pretty much almost like a journalist writing a report about visiting some other country. So it's very impressive. Then she continues, the gymnastics are very popular. Uh, well, uh, they have a baby, the government pays them 1,000 kronas. Uh, when you have kids up to 16 year old, you get additional 150 kronas per month. So all this information, she's just, sounds like she's very shocked. Uh, when you're pregnant, six months of pregnancy are paid and father gets two weeks of paid vacation 
and they got a total of four to five weeks uh, paid vacation. So she is from socialist country, but she got into the capitalist socialist Sweden, and she is very, very impressed. So they stayed in Stockholm for three days. So one of those days, maybe the last day, they had so-called free time. So they actually let them walk around town and explore. But they had to be at least five people in the group. So you couldn't just go by yourself. You should have a minimum of five people in the group. So then she continues. It's very bad not to know the language. We walk around like we are mute. There's so much of everything in the stores and everything is so expensive and we like beggars with our Copex. So remember, everyone had 20, I mean, sorry, $32 to spend for the whole trip. So they even didn't bother to walk inside of the stores. All we did, just pallets and vitrines. So they all did just window shopping. And at 1 p.m. they were departing for Oslo and she's writing that she just uh, kind of said goodbye to the port, enjoyed the music on the deck, and at 6 p.m. they were going through some bay with uh, many of little islands. They had rocky shores, and so along those islands you could see little homes, a very neat looking one, and Sometimes there, there's a small or big boats, and it looked very unusual because it's such a wilderness. You see forests, mountains, no trails, nothing, and suddenly there's a neat uh, front yard and the house. Everything is so comfortable, everything for people. Okay, so we're going to stop here. So our next uh, stop will be in Oslo, Norway which they stay there for three days too, October 24th till October 27th. So that'll be our next video. But it's already interesting, like, it's similar what experience that I had in America. When you actually see it with your own eyes, not through TV and state propaganda, it, it definitely, it's hard on your eyes and it's hard on your brain because it's just a totally different reality, not what you expected, not what you were programmed to. So she's already f- two days in Sweden, and she's already quite overwhelmed and impressed and surprised. So, yep, there's your Soviet person, first time ever uh, beyond the borders. Well, I hope you enjoyed this diary readings. I'm enjoying it myself. It's, I didn't read in advance, so it's kind of more fun for me to discover those things together with you guys. So it's a lot of fun. I, as I said, especially it really kind of same parallel kind of situation what I had experienced here in America when I arrived first time in 1995. Okay, so today we continue reading and analyzing Soviet cruise diaries written by angry wife Nelly who went on a two-week cruise across Northern Europe with her husband and the sad part of that cruise that they decided prior to the cruise that after this trip is over, they're going to divorce. And let's pause and think for a second. How desperate you would be to travel and see the world beyond the borders of the Soviet Union if you agree to go on a trip with the guy that you literally hate? And the fact that you paid so much money, I mean, that she had to work all summer, pick up any extra work, extra jobs she could to earn enough money to pay this insane amount of cash to go on this trip. So she goes with the guy she hates. She paid tons of money. It's how desperate some Soviet people were to see what's going on on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Okay, so back to diaries. October 24th. Till October 27, they visited Oslo, the capital of Norway. So they arrived there in the morning, and Nelly describes there was a humongous bay surrounded from all the sides with the bright colored homes and bright advertising. So, you know, in Soviet Union, we really didn't have a lot of advertising or hardly any. I only recall 
the ones that said Litaite samolotami aeroflota fly air float airlines but that was kind of silly advertising because that was the only airlines in the Soviet Union aeroflot so what the point to waste money advertise something that you have no other option <laughs> besides maybe take a train okay sorry back to Norway so while they were waiting for buses they stood on a deck and she noticed that highway was packed full with the non-stop flow of cars and the cars were all kind of different types and very bright colored she thought the cars looked very nice they looked very good but she didn't notice any single of the soviet models around 10 o'clock in the morning they finally got off the ship and she writes that oslo is the city of lilacs and the homes look like castles everything green everything maintained and she noticed that apple trees uh, she called them naked trees so like they had no leaves already but apples were still hanging and apples were huge and really pretty and it, she had an impression that there were artificial apples just hanging there and you know they hung for decoration she said they drove by many apotheket and i assume that's uh, like a drugstore and she mentioned she saw none in stockholm but she still continued repeating that how beautiful homes were they all were looking different they all look beautiful that her eyes were all over it it sounds i understand her because you know in soviet union people in the cities usually lived in this gray blah looking nine story high five story high or 16 story high apartment buildings and out in the country there was just this basic uh, primitive log cabin there was not much color going on her diary continues on october 25th and that was the birthday of her daughter who turned 13 so she writes that she missed her much and then she writes down for her daughter information about prices and she says a one dollar equal about five kronas so meat is a 50 kronas per kilogram one kilo of sugar two kronas bread three and four and in soviet union one kilo of sugar i believe was 70 kopecks seven zero and bread was around 20 kopecks then she's talking about the uh, price of cars they're about fifty thousand kron so about ten thousand dollars and to rent the apartment one thousand kron so you know for soviet person we had a subsidized housing so to pay a thousand kronos a month to rent apartment was insane money and we're talking about people you know soviet person was making average 130 rubles a month so this is about 20 dollars realistically and somebody's paying thousand kronos 200 dollars a month to live somewhere that was of course quite a shock average salary 50 to 100 thousand kronos a year and women get 25 percent less and retirement starts at 67 years and it's about 2400 kronos per month so the soviet group visited a summer residence of the norwegian king and she writes her residence looked like a barn dark color grass growing on the roof and a norwegian flag from there they went to the monument of the fallen soviet soldiers and they laid uh, flowers by that monument so this is interesting uh, part of every soviet trip to the other countries there were specific locations like they had to go and visit place of birth of karl marx or like in this case there's a monument of the fallen soviet soldiers I'm not sure why they have a monument in norway but that was a part of their uh, trip they had to go and visit that monument and lay flowers and flowers were uh, paid by government soviet government so they didn't have to spend their precious 60 uh, the 63 dollars they had they didn't have to spend any of those money on the flowers and then nelly writes finally after that they let us have some free time <laughs> so they all waited but finally they can just go uh, on their own and we raced towards the stores prices were insane at the grocery stores fruits vegetables 
meat, drinks, juices, everything is so beautiful. Everything looks good, packed. You can uh, tear your eyes off them. Then she continues, apples, pineapples, wines, totally unfamiliar vegetables packed neatly by two, three pieces in the box. Everything looks super fresh. Beautiful boxes of candy for three, seven kronas. I wrote down, check this out. I wrote down prices for many clothing items, but they are insanely high for our nine dollars. And here I need to chime in because when I was first time or second time in America, when I got in the grocery store and I saw individually boxed these little cute uh, boxes with garlic. So every garlic head was neatly packed in this cute box. I just laughing so hard because it was just so weird. How can you waste all this package? Because back home, uh, if the garlic, there'll be just giant bag of garlic and you just buy, you know, two or three or a kilo. No one even bothered to pack them like that. So back, she mentioned for our $9.00. So it looks like she's calculating, uh, they visited, they're going to visit seven countries. Uh, so they got $63 for seven countries. And in the beginning of the diary, they were talking, sounded like maybe per family, but sounds like per person. So each person had $63 to spend in seven countries. So $9 per country to spend on souvenirs. Uh, so... You can imagine how uh, horrible they felt, how poor they felt. Here they clinched their $9 to spend in a country where a box of candy is, you know, close to $2. It's, I, I feel her because when I came to America, well, jeans and uh, sneakers were way cheaper, like twice cheaper. But like groceries... They were so expensive compared with Kiev that, yeah, I, I hardly spent any money when I work at the farm and was had to buy groceries here in America. And, you know, I feel it because even before America, when I went to Germany in the early 90s, I think it was like 1993. And at that time, you know, I was still in college and my father's salary was about $6 a month for that current rate of exchange because they kind of let go, they weren't controlling rate of exchange in Ukraine. So here we're in Germany, and a bottle of water is two Deutschmark, you know, and my dad makes enough money pretty much a month to buy five bottles of water in Germany. So we spent all day, we had free time in Berlin, like half of day, and it was a really hot day. I didn't touch any water, I was so thirsty, but to pay two Deutschmark for a bottle of water, I was just like, there's no way I'm doing that. And back to the diary. And then she continues, pretty bitter words. The nastiest thing that happened today, actually, it was the worst thing happened in all this trip when he, and then she specifies husband, he didn't attend the gallery. So they went to some kind of art gallery to see pictures. She actually went... Uh, he, I guess he broke off the group and went to look around what he could buy. And then we came back for lunch. So they had meals at the ship because it was way cheaper. So he told me, let's go. I found something to buy. So I thought, and that's we're talking about her birthday, the, her daughter's, their daughter's birthday, right? That October 25th. So I thought that he found some present for our daughter. So he went. He took me to the store, and you know what he did? He bought himself a ring. She said, I was so pissed, I was almost shaken. To be so selfish and so bold, I, I can't even imagine that. The most expensive country that I visited, and he just wasted $10 on such a piece of junk. I'm very, very not happy. Okay, so we're done with visiting Oslo, Norway, and their next stop will be Dublin, Ireland from October 28th to October 30th. So we're going to continue that in our next video. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed this story. And for those who purchased my book, American Diaries 1995, and I already sold over 100 books from Amazon or directly to my subscribers who wanted the book signed, wanted a signed copy. If you please uh, go to Amazon.com and post a review, I would greatly appreciate that. As I mentioned, I sold around 100 copies, but I have only 16 reviews. So it would greatly help uh, to promote my book if you post a review on Amazon. Thank you so much. Большое спасибо. Today we're going to continue our Soviet cruise, which happened back in October of 1978. So let's turn another page in the trip diary of Nelly, Soviet wife from Varshilovgrad, Ukraine, who went on this cruise along with her husband that she despised so much and planned to divorce right after they come back home. October 28, Dublin, Ireland. Actually, in Russian we say Dublin. And I believe Irish people say Dublin as well. It's only 8 o'clock in the morning and we are already in Dublin. Pier shocked us. Everywhere was barbed wire. It looked more like a commercial port. So like means for the containers, not for people. Buses that came to pick us up were extremely comfortable. They had carpeting and all the seats were covered with velour. There's that ripped fabric. When we got off the bus, we found ourselves in some workers' district. Everything was dirty and it was raining. I saw a real live cat in the window. It looks like everyone is Catholic around here. I saw many churches around. People have very large families here from four and more kids in each family. Everyone has freckles on their faces. Everyone dressed really well. Medical service is not free. The more you make at your place of work, the more you have to pay to a doctor. Less make, less you have to pay. Okay, so here I would like to kind of pause for a second and add my own side note, because this is a really interesting comment, that families uh, are very large in Ireland and have uh, from four kids and more. This is a big deal and it really clicks with me because I remember like among all my friends, we had only one uh, family, like only one friend of mine that they had three kids in the families, three boys. Otherwise, I would say the rest of my friends that I knew, 50% is a single kid family. We're talking Kiev, Ukraine, and 50% maybe two kids. So, for example, you know, usually families want to have a boy and a girl. So, I don't know that when they talk about the population of the Soviet Union was growing rapidly because based on my experience, I don't see how it was possible because everyone I knew had only one or two kid families. And actually that family that had three kids, they had a special benefits, like they had a free lunches in school, I think. Like we had to pay for lunches, small amount of money, but they got it for free because they had a large family of three kids. Okay, so now back to the diary. So after the district where the workers lived, uh, they stop at some university town. She doesn't say what name. And right away she noticed that it's very pretty. Everything is clean. Got a lot of trees. And there's a nice mixture of uh, ancient, old, and brand new buildings. So I'm interested what the university town they visited. But once again, you see such a contrast. You got one district was dirty. And then another one, the university uh, town, a university college town that uh, looks very nice. It's a left-sided traffic here, so it was very unusual. We visited uh, the Cathedral of St. Patrick, and I was very, very impressed. Generally, Dublin looks okay, and despite of Stockholm, it's very crowded. There's a lot of people on the streets. People have meetings and speeches right on the streets. All you need to do is just stop by and listen, which is kind of interesting uh, side note over there. Then it looks like they walked by some shopping area because she writes down that very pretty shoes and a huge selection. By they, they, so the people who run the group, they didn't let us buy anything. Our curator, so like a main person in charge of the group, said, 
you're gonna buy something in England and uh, Dania, so Danish uh, country can think how to say it in English. So they didn't let people buy anything. Like they give them this tiny amount of money, right? And then they say you can't buy it. You have a nine dollars to spend in Ireland, and when they want to buy something, they say nope, you shouldn't buy anything here. But it looks like Nelly managed to buy something. She wrote down, "I purchased paint." for two pounds she doesn't specify what pain but i think when the women back in the soviet union say they bought kraska i think it usually means like hair color so she bought some hair color for two pounds then she writes something really funny and as she said this is a really funny accident happened we saw a nun who was getting ready to go swimming so she was taking her clothes off and i'm I never been in Dublin, so I'm not sure if there's like a public pool or maybe there's a river. Uh, so she said, my husband stopped and froze because he wanted so bad to see what she had on her dress, but he didn't see anything. So, yeah, there's the Soviet husband that definitely uh, interested in uh, females and even in nuns. October 29th, so that's the next day and they're still in Ireland. In the morning, we drank the most delicious kefir. I'm surprised right there. I guess uh, they probably had like liquid yogurt, but because I didn't know they in Ireland they had kefir. Then we had some oranges, some fruit salad with dried plums, cherna sleeve. There's another surprise. And then she writes, Then I tried for the first time grapefruit and I thought it was so disgusting. And next, Nelly writes something very, very interesting. So, this is October 29. They are on cruise for only nine days. So, this is the person that lived all her life in the small Ukrainian city of Varshilovgrad. She barely traveled in the Soviet Union. She never been overseas in other countries. Nine days later, what, this is what she writes. Suddenly, I wanted to go home so bad, very, very bad. Everything and everyone was just, I was sick and tired of them. I apologize, but here we need to hit the pause again and talk about it because this is very, very interesting. I experienced exactly the same situation when I came to America first time in 1995. And actually, I would like to read you a small excerpt out of my book which i'm talking exactly about the same thing but way in way more detail okay so now we are in american diaries of 1995 july 16 michigan hard to believe but today was exactly one month since i had left kiev and my incredible american adventures had begun it was mind-boggling just to trying to imagine how far away I was from home on my summer vacation in parentheses. Ukraine was 5,000 miles and 7 hours ahead. Out of the blue, I was beginning to feel seriously homesick. Other members of the Russian team soon began to share in my nostalgia. Both girls visited my photo room more and more often in the evenings to hang out and take a break from the English language. Maybe that was the reason for longing to be home. My brain was getting tired of continually being in a foreign language environment. So as I said, this is me, first time in America, which is barely a month, and I also had this horrible cravings, and I wanted to go home so bad. And even the girls I mentioned, we had a, a two girls from Russia, also working at summer camp, Yura and Lena, and they were actually students of the foreign languages so they actually studied english in college to become english teachers so you think for them there'll be so much excitement to be in english language environment but in one month they got tired of it and were uh, coming to my photo lab because i was a photography specialist and we were hanging out because they just wanted to speak russian and be away from english environment and if you want to learn more about my adventures in America, my book, American Diaries 1995, is available on Amazon, or you can purchase from me directly if you want signed copies. Link is below this video. And now we're back to the Soviet cruise diary. 
So she, after saying how much she misses home and how much she's sick and tired of everyone and everything, uh, she, Nelly said that they were talking about prices. So once again, every country they visit, uh, they learn about uh, prices and cost of living and then they discuss in their group because, you know, it's all new things for them because, you know, Soviet Union prices were stable and the same pretty much across the board, across any whole country. You can purchase the used car for six hundred dollars. You can buy a house with two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and they call it general room, so living room, for about sixty thousand dollars. So once again, it's a shock for Soviet people because housing is so expensive, and we had free housing pretty much in the Soviet Union. Besides, you might have to wait twenty years to get yours. And at the same time, cars are so cheap. In the Soviet Union, if you don't want to wait to buy a new car, you can buy a used car right away for probably more money than a new car. Or you can pay double the price or triple the price of the new car to get brand new car without waiting. And then she has that the pensions uh, for retirees was 14 pounds a week and they could use uh, public transportation free of charge. Then she said that while on this trip, they drove by giant uh, dump areas, so it's like where the trash goes, and said she was shocked that there are people wandering all over the place, and our guide said those were gypsies, and they live out of laws and out of society, and they survive by finding stuff at the dump yard and reselling it, and that locals feel bad for them. Then she writes, I saw several local teenagers. They flew by us like a wind. And I assume they were riding bicycles. Because I don't know how else they could fly by. They looked very loose. They were drinking something out of cans. And once again, we didn't have any drinks in cans in the Soviet Union. So she noticed that right away. She said it looks like a Soviet condensed milk. So that's kind of funny that she has this comparison. It looks like our Gushonka. It looks like our condensed milk in can, but it's way prettier looking cans and they have juice in there, beer or whiskey. And then she adds, they were dressed in different styles, but most of them were kind of like really Nibrezhna, so kind of not accurate looking. And once again, let's take a look at some pictures of me in 1995. And I have to admit, now I look at those photos and it hurts my eyes because I look so nerdy. But back then I was actually proud when I was showing my friends my photos from America from my very first trip to the USA. I was like, look, all those guys, they have untucked shorts, they look like crap. You could tell right away where the Soviet person is. It's always neat, tucked in, got the belt. So for us, back then in those good old days, the proper look was you need to be tucked in, you know, and now, of course, it's my brain changed and my, uh, just, I can't look at my own photos and just, it's just like, damn, it doesn't look good anymore. But back then I was actually proud that I looked the neatest out of all that crew. And that was a pretty much the end of the cruise diaries from Dublin, Ireland. And what she wrote then says, now I'm just uh, laying on the deck, on the chaiselons, on this uh, chair, and getting tan. So they're on the way uh, from Dublin, Ireland, to Marseille, France. Today, we are returning back to the cruise diaries of the angry Soviet wife, the cruise that happened in 1978. When last time we left Nelly, she was in Dublin, Ireland, and now she is in Marseille, France. Several of my viewers noticed that I posted the wrong map in the end of the last video about this cruise. And I want to apologize for that. It's my old KGB habit of once in a while to drop off some kind of disinformation and to judge the reaction. So good job for those who paid attention and noticed that map was incorrect. Some people also questioned, did it make any sense to travel from Ireland to France all the way around the Iberian Peninsula and going to Marseille? But this is what happened. Last time Nelly wrote date of October 29 when she was in Dublin. 
and next is October 31st when she arrived to Marseille. So they traveled two days by sea all the way around Spain through Gibraltar and into Mediterranean Sea. It's kind of strange, but that's how they went. So it seems as they spent in France five days from October 31st to November 4th. So her first uh, line is October 31st, and she wants to talk about their guide. So they have a new guide now in France, in Marseille. A couple of words about our guide, Lucy. She's 45, homely, but very sweet, and speaks Russian. She is from Paris. Her dad left Russia in 1905, so when the first revolution happened in 1905 and then October Socialist Revolution happened 12 years later in 1917. So her father was Russian and mother a uh, French lady from Paris or Paris. I'm talking French now. And she still has Russian last name, Timokhina. Then she continues. Once again, they allow us to dock the last so, sounds like maybe in Ireland they had a similar problem. And she says, once again, because of the strike in the port. I learned that trash collectors in Paris are also on strike. Lucie was constantly apologizing uh, that during our uh, tour, streets being cleaned by soldiers. Also, bakers are on strike, so there is hardly any bread. But it's so delicious, I still remember its flavor. So I told you many times that I thought that Soviet bread back in the good old days was delicious, but apparently she found French bread also very delicious. Then she continues about the meal. So they said the bread is on the table in the special boxes that we call chlebnica, so like bread box. So before they bring soup or meat, we will eat all the bread already. I was very shocked with their salads. They're just giant leaves, which I, I think the same way. It's really bizarre. Like we like our salads, you know, diced really in small pieces. But here it said the leaves are huge, like lapuhi, that's the plant, has the giant leaves. And over it is a mayo or other uh, Uxus, can't think the word right now. Uh, so all the other salad dressings and salt. And they put that salad on the tables in the giant plates. Eat as much as you want. Then Nelly continues. So we're riding on not very nice buses. It's interesting detail. So French buses she wasn't impressed with. To Dien. It's very pretty outside. We talk about prices. Once again, they care a lot about salaries and the cost of food, cost of rent and stuff like that. So the, we're talking again about prices. Jobs and pay depends of the uh, job givers, <laughs> for the employer. Work week is five days, eight hours each day. Young people have a hard time to find a job because they don't have any recommendations. Baby cereal costs seven, eight hundred francs, I assume, per month. You can ha get a pension if you're sick all the time. So it's like a sick leave, but you, you can get retired if you're too sick to work. Movie theater tickets, 16 francs. Theater from 40 to 100 francs. It's kind of funny because Nelly just jumps from topic to topic. Now she writes that candy is just amazing, huge selection. So she just totally in love with the French uh, sweets. We stopped for lunch. There were long tables with a bunch of food items on it. Wine and bottles with water called Calvados and Capuzin. Water was in very pretty bottles. Here I would like to pause for a second because I had exactly similar experience in Germany in the early 90s. You see, in Soviet Union, we didn't have a water for sale at all. We only had mineral water, and the bottles were really, like, bland. Just a basic glass bottle with the label, like Barjomi 
otros caveats mineral water. So when I saw water is like mineral water in Germany, they looked so amazing to me because they look so pretty, beautiful labels, but then I had a taste and it tastes exactly the same. So I was like, my goodness, you know, so life in Germany or life in France, like it looks so pretty, but if you have a taste of it, it tastes exactly the same. Okay, and now back to the cruise diary. Now listen very carefully. This is amazing part. I actually chuckled here. So she said that the bottles with water were very pretty. So many guys sat right next to them because they thought it was vodka. <laughs> so they see these pretty bottles with clear liquid. And what the Russian people think or Soviet people? Vodka. So they sat right next to them. They're all excited that they can get drunk. Then Nelly continues. They brought us four kinds of cheeses and several had mold all over it. It was very stinky, nasty stuff. So curiously enough, in November of 1978, just a little historical detail for you guys, Michael Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, was elected as the Secretary of Central Committee of the Communist Party of Soviet Union in charge of the agriculture. So while she is in France, in November 1978, Mikhail Gorbachev made his first large big step towards uh, to become a leader of the Soviet Union what like 70 years later I think it was uh, 1985 is when he was elected so it looks like they were riding buses all the way from Marseille to Paris that's a quite a trip so she really liked French roads said the three lane roads beautiful smooth not a single hole not a rock it feels like you ride on glass but you have to pay for crossing bridges and you have to pay for driving on the roads, so toll roads. We finally arrived to Paris. It's so beautiful here. We're going to live in a Hotel Astoria. Our place has two rooms and the bathroom. The bathroom is totally awesome. has a large window across the whole wall. Beautiful uh, faucets and other cool stuff. So we just dropped our things and went to restaurant. More because we were curious than hungry. Ordered wine, orange juice, and some meat. Everything looks beautiful, matching dishes and cups. And we ate, and we were free till midnight to do whatever we want. First time in such a long time. Just go and enjoy yourself. So it sounds like they had a curfew at midnight. She said 24 hours, so it's first time in, in a long time to let them just roam free the streets of Paris. November 4. Today I was so tired that I passed out while riding the bus. We've been uh, all over the Paris, had breakfast in one hotel, lunch in a different hotel, and for the rest of the time just look around, look around, and listen and listen. So they're on the bus. Sounds like riding all over Paris, uh, checking out uh, sites. Every evening they gave us fruits. I was always addicted to oranges, but now I'm tired of eating them. And my bag is full of oranges, apples, and bananas. So interesting details. Besides eating a lot of the fruits, she also packed in her bag to take home to Ukraine of oranges, apples, and bananas. I give your father meat and gi give me his fruits and every day i'm in my dreams feed you with oranges and talking to you so that's now she's talking to her daughter i feel like i was here forever everything is mixed up and i'm very very tired from this kaleidoscope every country is like some kind of fairy tale france especially shocked me I read a lot about it, and I thought I knew a lot about it, but turned out I didn't know a thing. Advertising is everywhere. It's overwhelming. And dogs. I love tiny dogs with a round face, tiny nose, and tiny eyes. can tell you what dog she's talking about. They're very pretty, all different colors. A lot of uh, furry ones, too. Just want to come close to them and give them a hug. Now, there's another really interesting, funny part. So she writes, 
We walk around the city, so they're doing window shopping again. And we hit our foreheads with the shop windows. And I hope it's translated correctly. So he said, they're so clean and there's so much stuff behind those windows that we forgot there's a glass. So they're like, oh, whoa, look. And they, bam, hit their head on the glass. On the street where we live, they sell meat and poultry. Meat is done so nicely like a artist did it. It's actually not disgusting to look at it. You can't really look at our meat, but here it's a real masterpiece. There are different stores on the street. They got groceries, they got clothing, they got hardware stores, they sell cosmetics and everything else, including antiques. And it's this tiny back street. We were supposed to see Benedictine. I'm not sure what she's talking about. Sounds like maybe some kind of show in theater. Uh, but since the workers of the port still on strike, uh, they made our stay shorter. People, my guess, she's talking about local French people, uh, brought us souvenirs, magazines, postcards, uh, badges, mirror, a bottle of rum. So we're saying goodbye. A lot of people are crying. We're not going to do our main shopping in England. I'm bringing you apple from Paris. It's very delicious. Well, goodbye, friends. They pushed us out of country eight hours earlier, but thanks anyways. Tomorrow morning, we're going to see England. I was waiting for that moment since I was a child. And my guess is since most people in Soviet Union studied English language, a lot of it was studying English using London. Like, London is the capital of the Great Britain, and in Trafalgar Square, and all these, like, most famous places in London, Big Ben and everything, that was in our uh, books, in our school books, textbooks of English. So, for me, it was amazing. When I was in England, when I was in London, it was like, finally you see with your own eyes what you studied for years in school. So maybe that's the reason why she's talking, waiting for England from childhood. She's probably talking also about her lessons of English. All right, so our next video will cover visit of London, England, November 5 to November 9. After that will be Copenhagen, Helsinki, back to Leningrad, Moscow, and Varoshilovgrad. Today we're going to continue our journey across the northern seas on the Soviet ship Estonia and follow the diary of the angry Soviet wife that she kept during this long two-week cruise through the countries of Northern Europe as well as France. And now her diary takes us to London, England where this group spent from November 5th to November 9th. November 5th we woke up and the ship was already anchored. Around us all boards can get to the shore. We were explained that we are fenced in just in case. Well, I'm not sure what she's talking about here, but sounds like they parked this Soviet ship somewhere in the far corner of the port and it was all fenced in with like wooden boards, so like a privacy fence. And they were explained it was for their own safety. And then Nelly adds, but I think they deeply don't care about us have no respect whatsoever. So I kind of get this feeling that she started realizing that for countries like France, England, Soviet people basically look upon like the second grade citizens and they probably feel themselves with this miserable amount of money they have with KGB personnel watching over them. Can't do that, can't buy that, can't go over there, can't do this. They feel depressed because, you know, back home they're probably like elite, uh, Soviet elite, Soviet intelligentsia in here, and these other countries, they just feel like they're second grade people. Then she continues. We went sightseeing in the horrible buses. So here we go. Different countries, different buses. So in London, they were offered horrible buses. 
It was a warm morning, so that's November 5th, 1978, and we drove by workers on strike. And then she continues, it's, I found it kind of funny. So they yelled something at us, and we pretend like we are not Soviets, like, this is not our business. Apparently, workers found out that you know, factory owners made huge profits, and they demand additional pay. Of course, the owner doesn't agree, and now they on strike for eight weeks. And she just, like, put exclamation points. For her, it's, like, something hard to comprehend. How can it be on strike for eight eight weeks or two months everyone has the family but they still on strike and she continues i want to go home so bad and we still have 10 days ahead so she's completely worn out she had enough and said the only good news finally everything comes to the closure and i am in england so the houses look and that's a kind of interesting uh, description she put the homes Along the road look strict, so you know, nothing fancy, no bright colors. Then they drove past one of the Ford factories and she was very impressed. She said, so many cars, all different kinds. Nelly continues, there are 1.5 million jobless people unemployed in England. So, you know, for Soviets, such a huge unemployment is something I heard of because, you know, Soviet Union was always proud uh, to have 0% unemployment. Our guide uh, said that his son already looking for a job for over two years. London has 8 million people. We stop at the bank and exchange our dollars to pounds. One pound equal two dollars. So we lost about three dollars. So you see, every penny counts, especially if you have 32 dollars to spend for a whole trip. So they lost on this exchange two, three dollars. And she noticed that right away. So see, like the scale is just hysterical. Nelly continues. Children dressed so-so. Something unusual. Little boys wear these funny looking hats. At the same time, the legs are naked, they wear shorts. So like in Soviet Union in November, you don't wear shorts. We saw something very unusual. A couple arrived in a limo. By the way, here they have a special seats in the cars for kids. So once again, I don't know if Nelly owned a car in Soviet Union, but she had no idea about baby seats for the cars. Well, car seats, they call them, right? There are many blacks everywhere. So once again, for the Soviet person to see a black person on the street, that's a quite unusual event. Everywhere advertisement about concerts, beer, coffee, and such. Cars are very cool. Finally, we saw normal homes. They look okay. And she's using this English word actually, okay. Homes in the middle of the city is really modern and really cool. We visited city. So the, in London, the business district, I believe it's called city. Was there huge buildings, Big Ben, St. Paul Cathedral and other uh, places of interest. Walked around and looked around. We were met by some strange people that carried white banners with messages such as Christos Vaskrias, which is Jesus uh, will be resurrected or Jesus is returning and Svobodu Pichati Vsesser freedom for the press in the USSR. So there's some people that have a banners in Russian waiting for the Soviet tourists in London. Kind of interesting. Then she continues. I went, I went into the drugstore, which we call apteka in Russian, and they have everything there under the sun, from towels to uh, flippers to the uh, hair colors. I went into three different drugstores, but I didn't see anything what look like our type of medicines or drugs. We spent all day going to different excursions. Then we came back to the ship and here we have food. Our guide left, her work day was over. It's boring here and nothing to do. I really want to go home. So yes, they spend every night here on the ship and they eat at the ship because it's cheaper. I'm not sure why, but Nelly skipped 
November 6th, so next is November 7th. We're driving to Tower, so I assume it's another city or town. And so they had a conversation on the bus with the guide about uh, cost of schooling, uh, cost of private school, and so on. And then it says, we arrived uh, to the grave of Karl Marx. So if you guys want to check it out, I guess in town of Tower, there's a grave of Karl Marx. So they arrived uh, to lay flowers on the grave of Karl Marx. So there's another part of the Soviet tourism. You visit famous... Uh, places like that then Nella describes kind of the funny way the actual grave she said on the gravestone there's a hairy head on the top but by itself the cemetery in the really bad shape and there's a grass everywhere collapsed uh, gravestone and such then they had lunch in the steakhouse and after lunch they had shopping time she said they all were literally running, trying to see as many stores as they can. She said, I ran all the stores twice. But anyways, everything is very expensive. So she's trying to find a cheaper place to buy stuff. And no success. Everything is very expensive in a store. I decided to spend my remaining 40 pounds. Jeans. Soviet people liked American jeans. She bought a ring, some fabric. Uh, some other clothing items and all the pounds were gone of course we couldn't get a lot but we bought something some people from Kiev bought rugs and were carrying them into the bus and then she says well talking about triapki so we call rags it's like a slang word for clothing so there's a special topic about rugs we can talk about it for a long time so you know yeah, yeah, excursions, school. Yeah, Karl Marx, grave is cool, but now let's do shopping and they'll run. Then she has a, a couple of words about stores. You approach the store, you step on a step and doors open. You go out, stores are closed behind you. So first time she experienced automatic doors in 1978. We never had those. She said service is top notch. But we are people from Mars. <laughs> it sucks so bad not to be able to speak, not to be able to understand. We can't ask about sizes. We act like Turks. So there's like an expression we have in Russian. If you act really stupid, you act like you're a Turk. You're from Turkey. Plus, it doesn't help that our guide constantly drags you by arm and says, don't take this, don't look at that. Don't ever even think about buying that. Damn it, why is <laughs> like God was mad at me? Uh, why he's on my ass? Pretty much is what she says. <laughs> then she continues about topic of uh, shopping. And it's kind of another curious fact about Soviet people. I wanted to remind, says you, about Comrade Kogan. That's what actually she said. I know I'm abusing the word Comrade a lot, but that's what she said. Tavarish Kogan. Comrade Kogan. Um, so. By the last name, I could tell he's a Jewish person, so he's kind of a businessman, and he has a shop set up right in the port. So he's specializing in selling stuff to poor Soviet tourists. So she says, when we were going on this trip, we were warned, so I guess by the people who went on a similar cruise before, don't buy anything from Kogan. His emigrant, his store is right at the port, and he sells everything or old or with some damages so that's why it's so cheap but of course no one cared and people bought a bunch of stuff from them one lady from our group purchased a fur coat and and that sent from Pid Institute so another and uh, so he's like a I mean I don't know how to say that sense so he works at the uh, college uh, the, for teachers so he bought it so he's like a teacher there like almost professor, but they call it that cent. So that's a one step below professor. So he bought a fur coat for his daughter. Another person, now that sent from medical university. So you see, it's a Soviet elite on this cruise. He purchased a tape recorder, so magnetophone, so like a boom box. Then Nelly continues. In the evening, we had a celebration dinner. A slice of sturgeon, nice. And she said, real one. 
but black caviar was she said by Dylan as a fake one. Then we had sweets and ice cream. Your father ate chicken uh, and I ate sweets, so they trade again. I thought that you probably would enjoy this food, but we are three hours behind you and you probably already were sleeping. I miss you a lot. We are saying goodbye to England. I'm very happy and satisfied. After this, I don't think I'll be surprised with anything. We have just a little bit left. One day of sailing, one day in Dania, Danish country, another day of sailing, then a day in Finland, then Leningrad, and Moscow, and finally Varashilovgrad. We're gonna be home. Okay, comrades, so we're now done with England. We have a little bit more left, and we'll be done with this diary. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you enjoyed this interesting Soviet cruise story. But I actually noticed when I was checking statistics on YouTube that every video from the Soviet cruise series is actually losing subscribers. Like now YouTube can show you how many subscribers each video gained or lost. And I checked every video about this cruise. I lose about six subscribers, which is kind of strange, but it is what it is. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please don't forget to put your likes. So we are back to our cruise story, reading diaries of the angry Soviet wife about her trip in November of 1978, two weeks cruise in Northern Europe and France. So the next entry is November 8th, and it seems like they traveled all day from London to Copenhagen. So Nelly writes that she went on the deck wearing her pantsuit, which kind of interesting detail that she actually had. I'm not sure if she purchased the one or the one she brought alone, but it was pants and some kind of matching top. And not many Soviet women were wearing pants. So it's interesting how she specified what she was wearing that day. She saw uh, some birds that she was trying to feed, but they didn't accept any food. And she mentioned there was a beautiful morning like she never seen before. And the whole day was just wonderful. So it sounds like they caught really nice weather in November. Then she recalls England, and it's quite interesting what she said. Uh, in Russian, she said, Strogost без зла, деловитость без хвастовства, величие без бутафори. That's pretty heavy, and uh, I can translate it like that. England was impressive. It was strict, but not evil. It was businesslike, but without showing off. It was grandiose, but without being fake. So it's quite interesting description on England. I wonder what you guys think. Then Nelly continues. In the evening, watch the movie. Unfortunately, she didn't say what movie, but I guess nothing impressed her. And after that, travlia anekdotov. So that's interesting uh, Russian expression, travlia anekdotov. And travlia it sometimes means like you are poisoning something, but also there's a word like dogs when they bark a lot. Uh, so that's like they were barking the anecdotes. So they were just uh, sharing funny stories in the group. And that's a very interesting part of the Soviet culture that I didn't realize didn't exist here in, in America. Like when I'm at work here in the United States, uh, people just, if you have a free minute, they call it here bullshit. And they just sit and they chat, they talk about maybe their trips, maybe their wives or children, just general topics they don't mind to share like about their family and friends. Uh, and of course, sports, and they can talk about sports for hours. It's insane. In Soviet Union, I guess we were more like guarded. I don't remember people ever sharing a lot about your own family with your coworkers or, you know, people in your school or your college. But if there will be a big gathering, there's a lot of people who maybe know each other a little bit. There will be just... Uh, Travel anecdote of they'll be just talking. Hey, do you know this anecdote? And he shares that one. And somebody was like, Hey, I have a similar anecdote on this topic. And it could be hours. People were just cracking jokes. And then, of course, if they're funny, they laugh. If they're not, they don't laugh. So, this is the same thing happened here on the cruise ship. Then Nelly mentions that she couldn't recall most of the jokes. So, if you spend a couple of hours just telling anecdote after anecdote, that's why we used to call them anecdotes, not jokes. And of course, you don't remember most of them, but she remembered the one. And unfortunately, it's actually a really cool joke, but it's hard to translate into English because there's the word uh, play. 
you know, the same word has a different meaning, but I'll, I'll try my best. So the joke is about that people on the cruise, all men can be divided uh, like a different category. So men could be tigers, wolves, or jackasses. And the jackasses is the ones that brought the wives along. So I assume tigers will be chasing tail, wolves will be chasing something else, and of course, and jackasses that brought the fresh meat for the first two categories. Then same joke goes, women, they are, uh, can be divided on dam, ni dam, and dam, no ni vam. And this is a really funny uh, word uh, play because dama, this is like madame, right, female. In Russian, we say dama, so that's the female, and that's the one who has a classy woman, right? So she is dama. Then nie dama is so the one that's not a classy woman. So it sounds like they're talking that all the women can be separated on, you know, ladies, not really ladies. And then they say dam no ni vam. And the game here, word game here is that dam also means like I'll let you have it. So it's actual joke that all the ladies, uh, they will let you have it, won't let you have it or they will let have it but not to you dam no ni vam so unfortunately is that it doesn't work really well in english but it's really funny um joke in russian november 9 Copenhagen. we arrived to Copenhagen a little bit earlier than schedule and the ship was uh parked at the beautiful place and we all took off right away so they went on the shore then it goes interestingly it says local businessman gave Ilya, so Ilya, I guess, one of the people who is in charge of this group. So local uh, businessman, entrepreneurs, предприниматели, uh, passed Ilya the address uh, where to go to visit. So that's what they like suggest. Hey, that's where you need to go shopping. And Nelly continues and listen very carefully what she says here. She's like, yeah, but first of all, we had to take care of our business before start shopping. Like everyone else, we are running around in order to sell our two bottles of vodka. We bought them in the bar of the ship. Barely, barely managed to sell it. So, he, so here's one answer. Someone posted a question. He couldn't understand the math. How come uh, this lady managed to purchase 40 pounds, British pounds, if she had only $32? So, of course, you need to keep in mind, she wrote this diary for her daughter, like for 15-year-old or 13-year-old daughter. So, of course, she didn't write a lot of specifics what they did on a cruise besides looking at the, you know, London and Paris. So, here we go. Here she writes what she did. So, they buy vodka in the bar and sounds like they're allowed to purchase only two bottles per person. Then they sell that vodka somewhere on the streets or they go to some stores uh, and they use that cash for shopping so it sounds to me like this is the day this is the place for major shopping because she continues there are a total of us of 500 people so the whole ship the tourists there were 500 people so we finally made it to the polish stores so i guess in Copenhagen there's an area where the polish stores are it says everyone wants to buy something and obviously all the sellers were tired so you got 500 people that trying to buy something like right now right now right now <laughs> and she says but it's not our fault they understand our language if you remember she constantly complains that like england france and other places she felt like dummy like a f person from a different planet because no one understand russian she doesn't understand the English or French. And here, Polish people, you know, Polish language is pretty close to Russian. So you can understand each other pretty good. I mean, pretty decent, especially if you have a little practice. And she says, prices are uh, way cheaper here. And even with our miser miserable cash, we are able to buy something in pretty decent quality. So we spend a lot of time and we stay at those stores up to 2330 military time, which means... They were there up to 11.30 at night. Then she uh, gives her shopping list, her achievement list. 
I purchased and she says uh, the rate of exchange was uh, $1 for 5.5 kronas. So she purchased uh, mohair. So that's that oh, stuff for making sweaters and scarves. Mohair, right? Uh, for 3 kronas. Then she bought a, a windbreaker jacket for 20 kronas and umbrella for 13 kronas. So that gives you ideas like what people wanted to buy I mean, basic items, but she's excited to purchase it in Copenhagen. Then Nella says, all my shopping was possible because of vodka. So she just admits that because she already was out of uh, foreign currencies just because she was able to use her rubles to buy vodka on the ship, sell the vodka on the shore. Now she could afford to buy some cool things. So we walked back to the ship very, very tired. And it's interesting she said they walked so there was no bus ride to the shopping area so it looks like it was just like okay have a free time on the shore do whatever you want so they had to walk around to find that polish a uh, shopping area they loaded it up now they have to carry all things back to the ship it says tomorrow we'll be uh, checking out uh, the city but today it was only shopping time November 10, after early breakfast on the ship, we all disembarked. We, everyone takes a lot of pictures. We, looking at the parks, bridges, statues, everything looks so great, especially the famous mermaid, the symbol of the city. It's always cool and there were tons of kids, looks like little birdies. There are a lot of bikes around. Everyone is riding bike to school or work, even old grandma wearing pants and riding the bike. So once again, they're on the bus and they talking to the guide, asking questions about life in Denmark. She said, half of the school are state owned, the rest are private. Teacher in school makes 6,300 kronas. On a factory, you can make about 10,000 kronas. People that uh, do like basic work, uh, make about 500 a week. Apartment without any conveniences, 300 kronas. The loaded nice apartment, 1,000. One place in kindergarten is 2,000 kronas a year. So you see like all these little questions about finances they ask in, in every country. Then she continues, uh, we had a dinner on the ship and dinners always had fr uh, fruit. So that's interesting because, you know, like in Soviet Union, once season is done, you can't find any cucumbers, any tomatoes. Like, you gotta wait till the next summer to see tomatoes again. So, we were really, like, vitamin deficient because you couldn't buy. Or if you, you can, you need to go to the bazaar and pay arm and leg for oranges from Georgia or something like that. So, she's very impressed that every meal has uh, some kind of fruit, you know, bananas, oranges, uh, whatever. And the last words in her entry from November 10 says, tomorrow will be 17 years uh, since we are officially connected. It's translated, but it sounds like she's talking about marriage. And she says, engaged on the paper. So she considers her marriage failed, but it's 17 years since they married on the paper. And said, if, if everything will be okay, I'll let you know about the date. So sounds like she is mentally prepared for divorce and said if everything's fine i'll let you know about the date of our divorce next entry is november 12 helsinki and i want to apologize uh, to my viewers they were all excited uh, waiting for helsinki capital of finland and it's literally two lines here i guess she just was so tired she didn't say anything about the city she just said that here in helsinki stores are also packed full but she is just tired she has no she's not in the mood not has no desire to look at the stuff and especially because here they pay only a quarter of the price for vodka otherwise we out of money so yeah my finnish comrades are very sorry but she didn't write anything about helsinki except that Finns didn't want to pay full price for vodka and they had full uh, stores that are full of stuff 
super short entry. <laughs> I apologize for that. All right, so we are almost there. I want to thank everyone who has a lot of patience to go with me through the Soviet cruise diaries. As I mentioned, every video uh, that I post, I see there's less and less views, and it tells me YouTube now can analyze and say, hey, this video, uh, you actually lost five subscribers, you lost two subscribers. So there's the flow, you know, the people uh, subscribe, people unsubscribe not a big deal some videos bring me a thousand subscribers uh, Soviet cruise is actually not popular but I think it's a really good topic to discuss and I'm learning too so as I said we're almost there uh, we got only a couple more entries November 13 November 14 and 15 it's pretty much coming back to Leningrad so we got Leningrad Moscow and I think it's very important this is really cool what she writes after seen uh, Western Europe for two weeks now she comes back to her homeland and how she now look at her Soviet reality after having a taste of capitalist reality so I think it's, you guys are gonna like it. it's really cool so well my friends we finally made it we're almost there the Soviet cruise that lasted almost two weeks is almost over and it's the final countdown. So our main character, Soviet angry wife Nelly, her unfaithful husband, and the remainder, about 500 Soviet citizens, successfully completed their cruise of the Northern Europe and came back to Leningrad. But before we return to her diary, I want to apologize one more time to all my listeners from Finland who maybe were waiting for some interesting details about visiting Helsinki. Unfortunately, she had no interest of looking at the town or shopping because she was tired and she was out of money. But I can share with you my impressions of Helsinki. I was there twice about maybe 10 years ago because every time I go to Ukraine, I try to pick uh, different flights, different uh, layover places so I can stay somewhere different overnight. So what surprised me in Helsinki is monuments, like there's Alexander, I'm not sure which one, maybe the second. So there's still a lot of Russian history in Helsinki, despite the fact that there's a quite a bad blood between Finns and Russians, and it goes way back. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Russia wrestled control over Finland from Sweden and made it kind of like semi-autonomous, uh, I won't say country, but region. I believe Finland had its own money uh, under Russia. And then, of course, Finland became independent after 1917 revolution in Russia. Then, of course, Winter War of 1939. So there's a quite a bit of conflict between Finns and Russians. So with my Soviet mentality, I would expect that Anything that relates to Russian, you can call it occupation of Finland, will be erased. Monuments will be taken down. Churches will be destroyed. But I was walking around Helsinki and I see this monument to Alexander II. I see Russian churches, some streets, uh, very Russian names of some uh, people that used to live there. So I was very surprised that Finns didn't bother to erase the Russian traces. Okay, and now we're going back to the Nellis diary. The date's November 13, when they arrived back to Leningrad. Early morning at 7 a.m., we grabbed our luggage and left for Leningrad. Everyone got sick and tired of us, and we got sick and tired of everyone else. So I think she's talking about being on a ship. We spent about an hour while we were waiting to return our foreign passports and receive our let's just say rodninki so our like our dear passports so here we need to pause for a second and kind of refresh a little bit about the uh, life in soviet union so when you live in the soviet union at age of 16 you get an inside passport passport ssr so it's a soviet union passport but it's only for inside country if you travel out of country, you have a special foreign uh, passport. So, and what sounds like they 
So Border Control uh, took their USSR passports and they only kept their passports for traveling to other countries. On the way back, they had to wait for an hour in line and swap passports back. So they weren't allowed to keep their passports for traveling abroad, which is kind of different because uh, when I got mine, but that was after Soviet Union um, was no more, I had both. So I kept my, you know, Ukrainian passport and I kept my uh, foreign traveling passport. Same here in America. I have, I mean, I don't have an American passport for inside. You use your driver's license, right? But uh, I have my uh, American passport for traveling to other countries. Okay, while we're on the topic of traveling abroad and passports, I would like to answer a couple of questions. Well, they were kind of similar. Why no one uh, tried to escape from this group while they were visiting Europe, and especially in those moments when uh, they weren't supervised, uh, they were just shopping and no one was watching over them? Well, first of all, I think Western media back then in 70s, 60s, and 80s created kind of this idea that every Soviet citizen just couldn't wait to run away from the Soviet Union, which is totally not truth. Uh, there are people that were not happy with the system and they were trying to leave. And there are cases when people went on the cruises and then they uh, asked for political assignment in the ports. But it was, you know, single cases. But of course, every time this happens, it will be in a, on TV and be newspapers. So it creates this perception that everyone was trying to run away. You know, like look at this uh, group photo. We're talking people in their middle ages. They're like in their 50s almost, right? Some of them in 30s, but a lot of them older. And they're like elite of this uh, small Ukrainian town. Earlier they mentioned some of them were docentes. So they uh, working in local universities and they're like almost at the level of professor. One step down is docent. I'm not sure how to translate it in English. Uh, so they are having pretty much good life in the Soviet Union, well-paid jobs, they got nice apartments, they could afford to spend their annual income on this cruise. And of course, don't forget, I didn't cover in this cruise videos the topic, but I covered early in my uh, Soviet tourism videos, you can check it out, that it was really hard to get approved to go on such cruises. So besides having a huge amount of money to spend, you know, picture if you make $50,000 a year and it's the price of the cruise, $50,000. KGB was checking you out, so you had to get a recommendation paper from place of your work or your study, so it was pretty challenging. And now back to the diaries. So they got their Soviet passports and now Nelly mentions that she has only a uh, not much money left, and she says it's 23 plus 25 plus 12. I'm not sure why she writes it that separate way. So it sounds like they have about 65 rubles left from the trip. Okay, so they have 60 rubles left, and she says, but we have a, a large needs. Lena, I assume it's her daughter, uh, doesn't have boots. Not she says have like needs a new pair. She says doesn't have boots at all. Yet без сапог. And I need a hat. And Nelly continues. Also, we need tights, kalgoty, and Grandma needs some kind of present. So our train uh, to Moscow. So now they're in Leningrad again, right? Our train to Moscow at 7:45 p.m. So we put our luggage in the storage area and went to Nevsky Prospect, which is main shopping area in Leningrad. So once again, we see here the Soviet reality that people in small towns, they didn't have access to the goods that people in large cities had. So like Moscow and Leningrad were supplied way better with, besides the groceries, with items like shoes and hats and stuff like that. So she is desperate to go shopping before they head out back to Varashilovgrad because they can't get boots and hats in Varashilovgrad. And back to the diary. Nelly says, it was cold, dirty, and tons of people. I had no desire to go through the stores. And especially look at the stuff at the stores 
it was just silly. So now she's she's seeing the stores in the West, and now she looks at the stores in Leningrad that she adored before, and she's like, this is just funny. And goods and the service. So she's not impressed anymore with the stores in Leningrad. I purchased a hat for Lena and myself. Everything is gray and ugly. You know how much I was impressed with Leningrad, and it turned out it's all plagiarism, plagiat. So she's just like, okay, so Leningrad is not that beautiful. It's just a ripoff of the Western uh, cities. And she says, Gorod Padrajanya. So she just continues like, this is the city, like a copycat city. We purchased some herring, selotka. So they actually bought some groceries too. Grabbed our luggage and loaded up on the train. It's dirty, dark, and we had some primitive dinner. Ужинаем кое-как. November 14. So they took an overnight train from Leningrad to Moscow. We got up in the morning and ran to Pavelecki Vokzal. So I guess their train to Ukraine would be from uh, Pavelecki Vokzal now. So there they drop off their luggage again in the storage. And she continues, it's cold, dirty, and train station stinks. Then we jump on the subway and went to Red Square. Unfortunately, Nelly didn't specify what they did at the Red Square, but I assume maybe they visited Mausoleum and saw Lenin. Maybe they just walked around. I doubt it's kind of cold. It's November in Moscow. Usually it's cold and not really good time to walk around. Then Nelly continues. Then we went to Tsum. So Tsum is a central Moscow shopping center, Centralny Universalny Magazine, I believe it translates. So it's a central universal store. And she said, I squinted. <laughs> I didn't want to go there, but I had to do something. So they kill in time because they train in the evening. We ate in some weird cafeteria. It's dirty, it's primitive, and I, I'm in a bad mood. Then we walked around town just to kill time. Otherwise, we decided to ride a trolley bus. So just to kill time, they just decided, let's hop on a trolley bus and run right around the city. So she said, at least it was warm in the trolley bus. By accident, we noticed the movie theater. So we hopped off the trolley and we saw the movie. There was a movie going called Prava na Lyubov. So it's a right to love. I was more falling asleep than watching the movie. Finally, dinner time, but we didn't eat in some fancy restaurants on the seventh floor, just in some basic cafe. We ate some soup, bouillon, blinis with meat, and coffee. Around us, tourists from Cuba. So that's interesting, another detail. So in November, they have a tourist from Cuba in Moscow. And the last entry in the Nellis diary, November 15. We have only two hours left. It's morning. Can't wait to be home. Can't wait to see you. To tell you how my trip was and find out how were you without us. Fortunately, we'll be home very soon. So here we are. That was the diary of the Soviet angry wife Nelly. That went on a long two-week cruise. And unfortunately, she passed away. But we got lucky that uh, her diary surfaced and we could discover. I learned a lot myself, so I thought it was very interesting. And if you guys think it's a good idea, maybe we can set up some kind of live show for those who are interested to discuss this cruise. If you have any questions, uh, we may talk about it. And my channel has just uh, got 38,000 subscribers, so we can celebrate 38,000 subs and talk about this cruise. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy this uh, cruise series and we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye.